Good morning. So today is the first video I'm going to do like this, and uh, let me explain what that is. Well, first, welcome. Second, uh, my name is Eric Johnson. I'm a veterinarian in Marietta with a specialty in fish health. I uh, treat dogs and cats all day, but aquariums and fish have been my hobby since I was very, very young. Moving on, um, the style of this quote video is uh, I'm going to record a narrative during my commute so that I can use my time wisely. And then what I'll do is build um, the video uh, visuals around the audio as opposed to the other way around. So uh, this will be an interesting thing, uh, at least from a creative standpoint. The purpose of this uh, message is to go over the use of salt as a treatment for fish diseases. And it's not as easy a subject as you would think because there are, after years of using it, there are a lot of conditions and, and uh, qualifiers to using salt. But I think I'm going to need to start from the basics and bear with me if you already know all of this. Um, I think what I'm probably going to do is ask relevant questions and then answer those questions to try to let you understand what I'm talking about. So as you approach this video, you probably clicked on it because you have sick fish and because you've heard salt works well on fish parasites and diseases and you want to know how to use salt more but one of your first questions would be what kind of salt do I need to use what's the basic concept and what sort of salt do I need to uh, be putting into my fish tank and of course I'll get to how to apply it uh, when and when not to later in the uh, in the track for starters um, salt is a uh, a good compound to use when you're trying to fight parasites. In particular, it's very effective against ick or white spot. Uh, that disorder is a ciliated protozoan parasite that a lot of people see in cooler water. Uh, pops up as little tiny white dust all over the fish. Uh, fish getting sick, clamping their fins and all that. And then these white dots appear and then losses can be heavy at that point. Um, and other ciliated protozoan parasites can respond to salt. Um, so when you apply salt to the fish tank, you're using uh, literally salt, but the, the kind you use is a relevant, uh, a relevant consideration. Um, the, probably the best salt for you to use would be a salt that's actually packaged for that purpose. Now when I say the best salt, I'm, I'm just going to say that, but that doesn't mean it's the only salt that you can successfully use. For example, if you're treating a pond outside uh, 3,000 gallon for example ornamental f uh, fish pond outside using those little quart containers of aquarium salt is going to be unbelievably expensive so you're probably going to be looking at for a bulk salt and those are available you can get 50 pound bags of salt uh, from various places uh, the key element there is to look for something that is pure salt you can get those uh, that recharge water softeners and uh, some water purification systems can be recharged with salt um, in great big 50 pound bags. You can get salt that they use on um, driveways and in the snow to, to uh, thaw the ice. The problem with some of those salts is they're very dirty. Um, certain kinds of rock salt or ice cream salt are not particularly refined. The crystals may be semi-clear, but you're looking at stuff that, that also has a lot of impurities. So, you know, there's that. To jump to the uh, point on that, when I treat ponds and other facilities like that, a lot of times I have used ice cream salt. That's a uh, Morton produces an ice cream salt in, I think it's five pound boxes over at the grocery store. It's something you can get your hands on on a Sunday afternoon when the pet store is not open. Um, you know, except these days the mom and pop pet stores that would normally close on Sunday are dead so you can probably get aquarium salt anytime you want uh, from a big box but that's just the bitterness of an old man at the death of pet stores where you could actually get decent fish and unique things um, what other kinds of salt could, I, could you use? you can use table salt 
Um, in fact, regular table salt is very good, um, if not ideal, because uh, regular table salt typically does not change the pH of the water. However, uh, certain forms of table salt are iodized. Uh, apparently, way back when, there were issues with uh, goiter because of iodine deficiencies. And so the food scientists put some iodine in the salt. Now, the funny thing about that is most of the time, the iodine in the salt doesn't make any difference. So using iodized salt is okay. Um, it was at one time believed that when you use salt with iodine in it, that there is uh, kind of a, an effect on beneficial bacteria in the system. And the fact of the matter is actually that that's overstated. Um, it's, it's actually uncommon. The effect on beneficial bacteria actually has to do with salting too fast and disrupting nitrification just by changing the uh, quote thickness or specific gravity of the water too abruptly. Uh, that disruption in nitrification is very temporary and it is not related to the iodine. So uh, table salt, even iodized salt is okay. I want to talk to you for a minute about two other um, quote impurities in salt that you might feel like using in your tank or pond and the, the one impurity is sodium aluminosilicate. That's basically just silica gel added in small enough quantities to the salt to keep a 50, 50 pound bag of salt from turning into a 50 pound block of salt. And um, sodium aluminosilicate is fine. Um, they could add that to you know tenths of percentages to the salt and it would be fine. There's another anti-caking agent called yellow prussiate of soda. That's YPS. And YPS fundamentally is not toxic to fish. If there's a problem with YPS or yellow prussiate of soda, it is that in water when you apply it, it becomes prussic acid. And as prussic acid, that's not a big problem for the fish per se. It has a tendency to decrease the pH. So you might say, hey, if I use YPS salt in Reno, Nevada, it's not going to be a problem because the water in Reno, Nevada can't be brought down as far as pH. The pH in Reno, Nevada is supported by a total alkalinity that is absurd in most places. In fact, uh, some of those folks are fighting to get their pH down. They should be so lucky if YPS would actually bring the pH in that system down. However, you go someplace in Florida where the water is very soft, alkalinity is next to zero, or even in the state of Georgia where out of the tap the alkalinity is 30, um, it's easy to drop the pH. And so in some circumstances where the pH is already floundering in the low range, when you use salt with YPS and it becomes prussic acid, you can see the pH getting a little bit too low and pushing some fish over the edge. So, uh, a word of caution about YPS salt. I guess if I had a choice between two bags, I wouldn't use the YPS salt. As far as YPS being, you know, deadly or a big deal or whatever, um, not so much. So, um, then there's another salt or two that you might consider using. Uh, that would be um, sea salt, and I've used that in a pinch, and it works just fine. But sea salt typically contains buffers, um, things uh, like sodium bicarbonate and calcium carbonate um, that are used to buffer the pH and alkalinity of seawater up to where the saltwater fish like it. and um, in most circumstances, the fish don't care because you're adding it to a freshwater environment where the pH is about neutral and the amount of salt that you're going to add is nowhere near. In fact, one third the strength of salt water, so you're not really buffering the pH up to salt water pH. But even if you did, for most fish it would be okay, except, say, Raphael catfish or uh, Caradon axelrodi, or uh, those would be neon tetras, uh, dwarf ram cichlids and things, discus that would prefer, not necessarily die in, but would prefer a lower pH, you might not want to use sea salt because it's going to bring the, the pH up. So if you're getting my drift, really, the salt that you might want to use would be something like dirty rock salt or aquarium salt if you can afford to, or 
water softener salt as long as it's 99% pure or just has sodium aluminosilicate in it and hopefully uh, I'll be backing all of this up with videos. And I do believe in a restatement of certain things uh, in case maybe my inflection doesn't create a sense of importance to something. If you see it twice, it's probably right up there with things that are kind of important. So we have an idea of what kind of salt that we might want to use, and we've covered sort of what kind of parasite you might want to use it on, and those are the ciliated protozoan parasites. There are two other categories of parasites that respond better to other medications, but when you're dealing with um, ick or costia or chilogenella or trichodina or epistylus, um, you're, you're going to do pretty well with salt. So let's talk about times that you might not want to use salt. Um, let's just say that you knew for a fact that you were treating costia. Let's just say that maybe you had um, a microscope and you had biopsied and found costia conclusively and you wanted to make sure that you got rid of the costia, I would reach for a product called Mardell's Clout, C-L-O-U-T, for costia, if I knew that I had that, or even formalin malachite, because if you use salt, there is a chance that the costia isn't going to clear, and then you're wasting valuable time treating with salt, and then find, realizing two days later that, that that particular strain of costia isn't going to respond, and in the meantime, you've lost fish, because costia is a hot fish killer. Um, but when you're treating the ciliated protozoan parasites um, and you're looking for kind of a shotgun treatment, um, there's two precautions to take, three precautions to take that I can think of right off the top of my head, and one of them is live plants. Uh, if you're one of those people like me who uh, appreciates the beauty and the function as a nitrate reducer of live plants, you're going to be sorry to hear that salt at the dosages that need to be used to kill ick and uh, kill a Janella and trichodina are too high for a lot of your freshwater plants. So uh, therein lies one of the major problems, and that is that you might have to remove the plants from the system if you decided you're still going to use the salt. Must use salt. Personally, I would use something different than salt if I had live plants, uh, perhaps reaching back to clout again. Um, but if you're going to use salt because it's available, you need it today, and you can go to the grocery store and get five pounds of salt for ice cream making, and you're going to use that, um, then you, you're going to want to know that you're going to uh, kill your plants in all probability. So if you pull the plants out, they still need to be treated with something. Um, because certain parasites, for example, costia, can resist drying. So even if you took the live plants out and said, I'm just going to lay them here in this newspaper, uh, they're going to take a hit because they're sort of drying out. I'll keep them damp. Well, that's just going to keep a lot of the parasites around. Um, so anyway, long and the short of it is be careful of salt around live plants. Maybe think of something else to use. Uh, another condition is, let's just say that whatever you're treating as far as a parasite is concerned, and you've ruled out pH and ammonia and all that other stuff, but let's just say the parasite that you're treating is causing a lot of respiratory issues. Fish are piping at the surface. Uh, of course, you would increase aeration with another air stone and kind of tumble the water a little bit but it might not be quite enough to oxygenate for those damaged gills. So these fish are piping at the surface, and then you add salt. Here's the problem. When you add salt, it causes the fish's gills to slime up a little bit more. Well, if the fish is barely hanging on and you increase slime production, that further coats the gills. Some of those fish that are piping at the surface are just going to die, which you might say, well, they're all going to die if I don't salt them up, and that's not an illogical thought. So just be aware that if a fish is a gasper and you go with aggressive salt therapy, you might slime them up just enough more to push them over the edge, some of them. So you might say, well, what do I do about that? And I, I would just increase aeration and get the water temperature down a degree or two in order to uh, facilitate oxygen transfer and hope. Um, the third time that you um, 
might be hesitant to salt would be what are you going to do with the water? Um, and this is one of the reasons I seldom, if ever, use salt in my larger fish tanks is because unless I can discharge that water someplace safe uh, from my lawn or a tree or plant in my yard, um, like if I can discharge it through a, a snake to uh, the toilet or the shower drain, then I might use salt. But when you use salt, you, you have this crusty water um, to get rid of at the conclusion of the salt uh, treatment. And, you know, for you with a 10 or 20 or 30, maybe even a 55-gallon tank, you might be like, yeah, whatever, that's no big deal. In which case, just pass it up. But some people are treating facilities that are 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 gallon ornamental ponds in their yard and uh, you have to think about what you're going to do with that water once you've salted it up because it will kill grass uh, for better or worse. Um, so those would be kind of the three different reasons I might hesitate to use salt. Somebody might say, oh, well, wait a minute, what about the, the fish that can't handle salt? Um, they exist. There was a rumor that uh, the wild-caught Brocus Britsky Corydoras catfish uh, from South America could not handle salt. Um, eh, that's kind of a thing, because anymore, um, a lot of Brocus Britsky come from captivity and have been adapted to some of the conditions of, of captivity and can handle the salt. Uh, and I've never tried salt on wild-caught Brocus Britsky because I love that species, and I am not killing them, because when they are wild-caught, they're often $11 each or more. Um, so... You, you hear what I'm saying? So in the book, for example, there's a list of uh, fish that could very well be sensitive to salt. And then there's species, I'm sure, that I haven't tried it on that are. I would figure softwater fish, uh, deep Amazon, especially wild-caught fish that pretty much have never seen a sodium ion in their damn life, um, probably would have a problem with salt. So, But, you know, I think by the time you're keeping uh, South American, you know, deep – Amazon biotope fish like that, you're probably beyond the level of having put a parasite fish in your tank without a quarantine. So I don't know who I'm talking to with the advice to be careful of soft water South American fish. Um, lots of other fish actually thrive in salt. I don't know if you're aware, but one of the reasons that uh, some people have trouble keeping platys alive is because platys like a saltier alkaline water and do a lot better with just a pinch of salt in the water all the time. Um, any of the Pacilia species, Ziphophorus, any of those guys uh, like a little bit of salt in the water, do better. Sailfin mollies, you know, some people really love those marble sailfin and gold sailfin mollies. Wonder why they have such a hard time keeping them around. Well, if you can give them good water quality with a pinch of salt and a little alkalinity, those fish thrive. And they get pretty big. So backtracking, um, those would be the reasons to hesitate to use salt. And uh, some of the species, you know, you just have to be careful. If you have any experience in that regard, it wouldn't be a bad idea to leave some comments below this video. I will uh, approve those and, and let them go through for the benefit of others. Um, so we've talked about why you'd use salt. We've talked about when you wouldn't use salt. We've talked about the kind of salt that you might use. Uh, some of the precautions about using it, sliming up the fish, killing your plants and certain species. Um, let's talk about exactly how to use salt. Uh, this video isn't going to talk about salt dips for freshwater fish because, frankly, I don't like salt dips for freshwater fish. That's basically making a solution of 3% salt, which is approximating water from a saltwater tank. And now, that's not to say I haven't used a saltwater tank for freshwater dips, because I have, because they were convenient. And if you know when to pull the fish out, it can be successful. But saltwater dips usually are too short to kill certain of the ciliates. They stress the heck out of those fish, and frankly, they don't address an environmental situation. So if somebody says, oh, you've got this particular parasite, you should treat with... Um, Salt dips, you're not fixing the environmental issue. Those uh, swarmers and trophonts and trophozoites and mesozoites and scugid murkers are all still in that tank, and uh, you're just touching the tip of the iceberg with salt dips. So for the purposes of this video, how to use salt, um, that's not a situation where salt dips are, are really relevant. I don't 
I don't care for them. So how to apply salt? I like salt at 0.3%. 0.3%. Now, the Germans think that's hilarious. The Germans like 0.9%, which is the physiological salinity of blood. Now, <clears throat> you might say, well, uh, what's the matter with that? And, and almost nothing, because at 0.9%, you can bet that most, if not all, ciliates take a dirt nap. Uh, the problem is that's pretty darn stressful on fish. Uh, there's certain species, if you wanted to push some buttons as far as South American fish not liking the salt, 0.9% is hard on those, hard on baby fish, uh, hard on certain goldfish. If you're treating natkins, uh, it's a kind of goldfish that's scaleless, uh, with salt at 0.9%, it's going to be an issue. Um, I like 0.3%. Some people jack it up and double the dose to 0.6%. That's completely okay. One of the problems with going with 0.6% that I found is if it wasn't successful at 0.3%, you're only getting an extra 25 to 50% chance that more salt's going to work. Does that make sense? You're doubling your liability as far as the salt, but you're not by any means doubling the efficacy. Uh, it's half again the cases that are, are going to go, okay, the salt's high enough, I guess I'll die off. Um, once you feel like you've got a salt-resistant costia or a salt-resistant trichodina or trematodes that resist, uh, jacking up the salt over 0.3% half the time isn't even successful. Okay, salt, uh, the dosing is going to pop up on the screen uh, to make 0.3% uh, in the... Uh, smaller freshwater facility, you're going to see something like three teaspoons per gallon. Um, and then in the larger facility where you're dealing with hundred of, hundreds of gallons, um, you're probably going to see something like 2.4 uh, pounds per 100 gallons um, measured by weight uh, to get the 0.3%. Some people round it up to three pounds per 100 gallons to get 0.3%. Uh, uh, that's fine, but the slides that I'm going to put up uh, to support the audio in this video are going to have uh, fairly exact dosing, but here's the thing. Addition of the salt can be done two different ways. Um, let's just say that your fish have chilogenella. Somehow you know that. Microscopy or the way the fish are dying or you're in a damn hurry or whatever. Some people will just add that all at one time. Three teaspoons per gallon. Boom! In the morning on the way to work. Uh, I guarantee you that if a fish is piping at the surface, it's going to go ahead and die. Um, if the fish are, you know, doing that whole body waggle, I'm probably going to die adding the salt all at one time. Uh, however, the fish that are still a little bit strong are going to benefit from having the salt added all at one time for two reasons. One, it kills the parasites faster. And two, it increases the odds that the parasite's going to die harder, too, because of the way salt works. It has a tendency to create an osmotic challenge for the parasite. In other words, the water goes from nice, clean, fresh water to this thicker, higher specific gravity stuff, and that causes water to run out of the parasite. In other words, the parasite is more dilute than the um, environmental water, and as such, um, the water runs out of the parasite and it crenates, and, and thus is the end of that parasite. It turns into a raisin. Kaboom. And if you add the salt all at one time, that just happens a little bit harder. That's one of the reasons that the weaker fish can be pushed over the edge, but it's another reason why the parasites die a little harder. Okay, um, so one way to add it is all at one time and take your chances. Uh, the other way to do it is to add it gradually. And then even that has caveats. For example, you could do, and this is my preference, is to do uh, thirds of the dose. So if it's teaspoons per gallon, you're going to add one uh, third of the dose, a, a teaspoon per gallon, and then come in 12 hours later um, and do a teaspoon per gallon, and then come in 12 hours after that and add a teaspoon per gallon, which is a gradual, more gradual application. But let's just say that you're in a big hurry, and, and you wanted to do the in thirds over every six hours. Okay, well, it's still calmer and a little bit more gentle than doing it all at one time. And if the losses are heavy, and you're pretty sure it's a parasite, 
I think maybe uh, dosing in thirds every six hours is a great idea. And then there's other people whose fish are infected with something. They know it, but the, the mortalities aren't particularly uh, hard. Let's say you just happen to diagnose Kiladinella on a random biopsy, just uh, maybe during a spring clean-out or something like that, that the folks that do your spring clean-out, yay, uh, they do a biopsy and an environmental assessment. Um, and they find Kiladinella. Okay, yeah, when you uh, finish with the clean-out, go ahead and put salt in there if you want to, if you're not messing with live plants. And uh, you could apply that in thirds every 24 hours. You just better not be in a hurry at that rate. And they think it's being a little bit coddling to parasites. Eh, so I guess if I was making a general recommendation, it would be dosing in thirds every 12 hours. Get it all wrapped up in 36. How long do you leave it in there? Well, it kind of depends on the parasite you're treating. Uh, the minimum I would leave it in there would be, just in case you miss something, would be three to five days. If you're treating ick, you're going to have to leave it in there for three to five days because the only way salt kills ick is in its swimming phase. The swarmers, when they come up off the bottom of the tank to attack your fish, the swarmers are highly salt sensitive. And so you kind of have to wait for the ick to drop off the fish in its packet down to the bottom, sit there for a minute, then swim up to kill the fish. And when it exists and comes up off the bottom, that's when those swarmers go, ah, and die in the salt. Well, that can take up to th five days in cooler water. In cold water, it might be all winter, which is why. All my recommendations for the treatment of ick include something like get the water over 75 degrees. Uh, and that moves it right along and allows salt to help much, much quicker. So uh, there's that. Um, thirds over time, leaving it in there three to five days. Doing a micro microscopic biopsy, a little uh, skin scrape. I might just upload a video of how to take a skin scrape. Not that you're going to be doing that this week, but uh, hopefully if you hang around my channel long enough, you'll be exposed to videos of like how to buy a microscope and, and uh, tutorials on how to use a microscope. And You know, it's, it's easier than you'd think. I've never encountered somebody who was befuddled by using a microscope with proper instruction, just showing them exactly what to do. The parasites look different enough that you should be able to identify them with much, without much problem. Um, no two of the parasites of tropical fish look very much the same. And if you're looking for practice fish, you can go buy feeders almost anywhere. Uh, some pet stores uh, in the big boxes, some of those don't use salt in their retail tanks at all. Um, no prophylaxis whatsoever. And so you can find some pretty good parasites at the different big boxes. Uh, for study, if you want to, uh, and this is, you know, this is one of those times that you might want to have a pen and paper handy because this is a little tidbit that you might not know. If you want to find all seven parasites on the fish for study, uh, the best ones to get are going to be those little top minnows that you find in natural bodies of water. You know, those little, uh, what do they call them, mosquito fish? Those little guys are very hardy. They're used to these parasites after all of these years in the wild. And uh, lots of times you net those little guys up and you can find a, a plethora, a cornucopia of parasites for the win. Um, sometimes, this is so frustrating about trichodina, for example. Again, don't you wish you had a pen and paper handy? Sometimes with trichodina, you'll collect some diseased fish for a fish health course and you'll put those fish in some clean water in a holding facility, no treatment, no salt. And you put those in some clean water, and overnight the trichodina takes a dirt nap. Just because it prefers organically rich, high background pollution, high CO2, high dissolved proteins. Just basically, they, uh, trichodina likes crappy water so much that when you bring some fish in for a fish health class, if you keep them around too long in clean water, those parasites will, will go away too. I think that's pretty interesting. Um, a lot of times you'll have a fish health class and all you'll find is flukes because those guys, man, they want to stay. They really want to stay. Uh, sometimes you'll find ick because it hasn't gotten off the host yet. Um, and then, of course, if you've got fish from the wild especially, 
fresh out of the wild. We used to get some out of rye patch in uh, Reno, Nevada. Those fish were usually pretty rich if you didn't hold them too long with parasites. Uh, I've been lucky with, um, if you can go to a pet store that does not salt their mollies, uh, those are hot. Um, because mollies, without any salt in the water, are usually pretty stressed and uh, vulnerable to infections. And then, of course, also without salt in the water, the ciliates have no reason to back down. And so uh, black mollies from stores that don't salt are great for um, fish to biopsy. But, hey, I'm off the subject of salting and how to use salt. Let's recap. Um, we talked about ciliates, the reason you'd use it. One or two of the ciliates and parasites, it's not going to respond to salt. That increase in the salt at that point to 0.6% only has a half a chance to improve the results. Um, we talked about a couple times, and you might not want to use salt, including what are you going to do with the discharge water. Um, we talked about uh, live plants as being an issue. We talked about the kinds of salt to use, which salts matter, and which salts don't really matter, what some of the impurities might be intentionally. Uh, possibly what some of the impurities might not intentionally be, like dirty ice cream salt can have literally sand and dirt in it, rocks, which aren't necessarily a problem. We talked about how actually to apply the salt. Sorry, I waited to the end of the video to tell you about that, but uh, dosing in thirds is a smart idea. Um, you probably got that. And leaving it in for three to five days, uh, shorter for 78 degree water and much longer for very cold water. And... Um, if I've forgotten something, I'm going to have to shoot a little extra video or add it to some slides at the end. Because I think we've successfully covered salt. And I think this video is going to be pretty good. I appreciate you visiting. If there's something I forgot or some experience that you've had relative to salt that you'd like to share with other aquarists, I would really appreciate it if you'd put it in the comments below. My comments are submitted on an approval basis because there are people on YouTube, and I know this shocks you, but there are people on YouTube who spam advertising and uh, political rhetoric and a whole crap ton of other uh, evil, evil things that they post, and I don't want them in my channel. I also don't want people asking me, uh, my fish is sick, what should I do? Because I don't answer that question in the comment sections. Um, so uh, the long and the short of it is, if you have a comment, please put it at the bottom, and I will approve relevant comments to the use of salt for this video. And uh, I would appreciate it if you would like and subscribe to my channel so that I am encouraged to make more videos and that would be amazing. It would also help bring the videos higher in YouTube so that more people can be educated on these issues. Did you ever think a salt video could be so long and that there would be that many caveats to using salt? Exclamation point. Hashtag use salt. Hashtag be careful. Hashtag be good to each other. Thanks, Eric.